Welcome to a discussion on the control of nuisance animals in the garden and landscape. My name is Phil Radebush. I'm an Extension Master Gardener volunteer in Buncombe County, North Carolina, a retired veterinarian, and a certified Blue Ridge naturalist through the North Carolina Arboretum. I enjoy talking about nuisance animals in the garden because of my background and long-term interest in gardening, veterinary medicine, and natural history. Today in this presentation, we'll focus on bees, birds, and snakes. This presentation is part of a series of nine gardening videos on nuisance animals that also includes information on the other topics that are listed here. If you're having problems with a specific type of animal, you may want to watch one or more of these other videos. All these videos can be found on the Buncombe County Master Gardener website, which is buncombemastergardener.org. So let's get started. If you have problems with bees in the garden or landscape or in your home, it's usually going to be a bee swarm. Swarming is a honeybee colony's natural means of reproduction and is usually a spring phenomenon although it can occur during any of the warmer months. Bee swarms can situate on landscape plants, buildings, or vehicles. Usually a tree or a large shrub is the most common swarm transition spot. Bee swarms can appear quite quickly. There was a recent news story about a man who went into a store for about 15 or 20 minutes and left the rear window of his car partially open. And when he came out 15 or 20 minutes later, he found that a bee swarm had established itself on the outside and inside of his vehicle. So these can appear very quickly. Gardeners and homeowners should contact local beekeepers, beekeeper organizations, or licensed wildlife damage control companies to remove the swarm. For those of us in Western North Carolina, the Buncombe County Beekeepers Club maintains an excellent website, wncbees.org, and they have a spot there where you can click and report a honeybee colony or swarm. After you do that, a local beekeeper will contact you to remove the swarm. Most birds are federally protected through the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. This was first enacted in 1916 to implement the Convention for the Protection of Migratory Birds between the United States and Canada. In subsequent years, it's been extended to include Mexico, Japan, and Russia. It's considered to be one of the first environmental laws that was enacted in response to the decimation of wild migratory bird populations because of the popularity of birds and bird feathers and their use on women's hats at the turn of the century. Currently, there are more than 800 species that appear on the list. Under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, it's unlawful to pursue, hunt, take, capture, kill, or sell birds listed as migratory species. That includes their eggs, the nests while they're actively being used, and feathers. There are some migratory birds such as waterfowl that may have hunting seasons that are outside of this act. There are three species, however, that are non-native and are unprotected. And these are shown here. The rock dove or the feral pigeon is non-native and unprotected. And of course, you've probably seen it in urban areas. It likes to feed and roost in flocks and becomes a nuisance when they soil buildings, sidewalks, and window legends. And as you've probably realized, they've become so habituated to people that you really can't scare a feral pigeon. Secondly, the house sparrow is not a native. It was introduced to the United States around 1850. It's also unprotected and often flocks near human habitation. And finally, the European starling is non-native and unprotected. It's found in virtually all human-modified habitats, 
It likes to feed and roost in large flocks. It may occasionally damage crops, but it also has some benefit in that it also eats many insects that are harmful to plants. Now a protected and native species often confused with the feral pigeon is the mourning dove that's shown here. It is a federally protected species and should not be confused with the unprotected feral pigeon. These are the four birds that are most likely to cause problems in the home environment or landscape. The first is the American crow. Crows are omnivores. Uh, they can pull up seedlings and eat ripe vegetables or fruit. They can also dive at people. They often occur in small groups of three to six individuals. A group of crows is called a murder of crows, but they are federally protected as a migratory bird. The other three birds that often cause problems are called icterids because they're all part of the New World blackbird family. That includes the red winged blackbird, the common grackle, and the brown headed cowbird. When they aren't nesting as individuals, they're often found in large mixed flocks in open fields, woods, and marshes. And these flocks can be quite large, sometimes exceeding tens of thousands of individuals. They'll also pull up seedlings and eat ripe vegetables and fruit, especially sweet corn and melons. They may dive at people. Again, they have migratory bird protection. These are some examples of the kind of damage that can occur, especially from crows and icterid birds. You can see damage to vegetables like tomatoes and sweet corn. They especially like tree fruit, such as peaches, and they also will cause damage for melons. As I said, both crows and icterids can dive at people and be a nuisance in that regard. I found this picture on the inter internet, which I think is fascinating, of a red-winged blackbird is trying to protect his territory and has actually landed on a hawk and is harassing it. We have a community herb garden in our community that I like to work in and it's right down next to Anka Lake and I always wear a wide-brimmed hat not only for sun protection but because red-winged blackbirds like to nest along the lake and when I'm working in the garden they will come down and flutter right over my head and sometimes try to land right on my head. So I use that broad brim hat as protection against the bird. Woodpeckers are a migratory non-game species that are federally protected. They cause problems usually related to building damage and they can also sometimes be annoying because they'll uh, create large sounds due to territorial drumming, especially on metal objects as pictured here. A wild turkey is frequently seen in groups foraging for insects, seeds, and fruits. And they may cause depredation of cultivated fruit trees and sometimes they will tear up the ground with their sharp claws when they're foraging. For a number of years I lived in Kansas and had a couple of pear trees. Oftentimes when the pears were beginning to ripen I would go out and find that most or all the pears had been removed from the tree. I knew it was probably a wildlife species of some kind, but I wasn't real sure exactly what it was. My wife went out one morning and found a whole flock of turkeys in the tree and under the tree just pulling the, the pears off. So it shows you the kind of depredation that sometimes can occur with wild turkey. Canada goose can be a big nuisance. They are primarily herbivorous and normally migratory, although some species will remain locally throughout the year. They're extremely skilled at living in human altered areas. They really are a pest species because of the excrement that they leave behind. They can sometimes cause depredation of row crops. They can have nuisance begging behavior, and aggressive territorial behavior towards both people and other animals. So what can we do to help manage nuisance birds? Well, one thing is we can learn to live with them. Uh, again, when I lived in Kansas for many years, 
My neighbor across the road loved the crows. And we had a small murder of crows, usually about five or six individuals that frequented both his property and mine. But he loved to feed them, and he would feed them corn and crack corn. And so they were really his uh, outdoor pets. And by feeding them, the crows would come onto my property, but never uh, cause any problems at all because they were well fed and, and satisfied. So one thing you could certainly do is go ahead and feed the birds and consider them your friends and not your enemies. Major way to manage birds is to modify the habitat. This can be done with spike strips or other types of repellents to discourage roosting. You can also, in, in the case of Canada geese, allow vegetation to grow up along waterways. They don't like to fly into your yard, but like to walk up out of the water. And so you can discourage that by allowing vegetation to grow up. If you don't have vegetation along waterways, you can use fencing. You can also use a netting for exclusion. Frightening or scare tactics can sometimes be successful on a short-term basis. So scarecrows, snake or owl effigies, whistle bombs, flags, balloons, mylar foil streamers, and lasers can all be used to scare away birds. Dogs are very effective at helping to scare Canada geese. In many urban areas, there are individuals who have border collies, and you can pay to have them be on your property to scare away the geese. When it comes to netting or fencing, one website that I found helpful is called Bird Be Gone. They primarily have products for professional bird control, but it can really give you some good ideas for different types of species, not only the products that they have, but other techniques for managing nuisance birds. For Canada geese, you can use a certified or licensed animal control company to do what's called addle the eggs. And if you can find Canada goose nests, they will identify the nesting sites, identify the eggs, shake the eggs, which will prevent those eggs from hatching, and that will help to control that local Canada goose population. And certainly for both the Canada goose, other waterfowl and turkeys, uh, there are legal hunting seasons that can help with management of a nuisance bird population. There are at least 38 species of snakes that are found in North Carolina, of which six are considered poisonous to human beings. In the mountains where I live, about 15 species of snakes are common, and there are only two, the copperhead and timber rattlesnake, that are considered poisonous. Snakes that are most often found in the yard, garden, or landscape include the eastern worm snake, black racer, southern ringneck snake, eastern rat snake, eastern hognose snake, corn snake, and the eastern garter snake. At least in my yard and in my neighborhood, the two snakes that I see most commonly are pictured here, the eastern garter snake and the eastern rat snake. And even though snakes in the garden and landscape often cause concern, they're one of the gardener's best friends. And so certainly if we think about both the garter snake and the rat snake, they can be very helpful to keep rat, mice, bull, and rabbit populations in check. Strategies for discouraging snakes include habitat modification, Pictured here are two of the more common places that snakes like to set up their dens or to hide or to hunt, and that's wood piles and rock fences, so you can modify the habitat appropriately. There are also snake-proof fencing options that are available, as shown here. Although the eastern rat snake is an excellent climber, and there's no way you're probably going to exclude them with fencing alone. There are rep repellents uh, such as liquid products that contain essential oils that are marketed. They're generally not effective. They may be effective in a small enclosed area, but outdoors probably not really effective. And certainly trapping of snakes is usually not advised. There are some fencing options that can be used. 
Uh, one of the biggest problems I've had with eastern rat snakes is them getting into bluebird boxes, and you can use some fencing around the, the bluebird boxes and also netting on poles to help discourage snakes. So that's our discussion today on bees, birds, and snakes. And I hope I've given you a few tips or ideas about how to manage these when they become a nuisance in your garden or in your landscape. If you need other help or have other gardening questions, I encourage you to contact the garden helpline through the Buncombe County Extension Master Gardeners. They're available during the growing season, March through October, by phone or in person. Or you can mail your question by email to buncombemg at gmail.com. That's a good way to submit your question. And not only that, but pictures of plants or pests or uh, plant problems. Thanks for joining me today and happy 